Hello everyone, this is Bob Browner with Community Coronavirus Update number 73. We'll talk about the latest Nebraska numbers, uh, some things that might explain them like uh, possible reinfections, uh, the J&J &J vaccine update, and some travel safety and vaccine verification issues we need to start thinking about. So uh, how are we doing uh, here in Lincoln, Lancaster County? We're still sort of in a holding pattern yet, uh, where numbers certainly are better than they've been, but they've kind of just been leveling out. They pop up and down a little bit, but we've not really made a lot of progress here uh, in essentially two months. And I think I have some ideas about why that's likely the case. Uh, the rest of the state, you know, Doug, Omaha had an outbreak, uh, a little bit of a blip because of uh, uh, Easter weekend, but thankfully this is ameliorated probably because of vaccination. And the rest of the state as well seems to be dropping, uh, but not as much as you might think. So people who thought we had herd, herd immunity and numbers would drop like a rock are wrong. And they're wrong, I think, because of uh, a couple of reasons. So, uh, you know, on one hand, yes, we are getting a lot more people vaccinated. On the other hand, though, there are people certainly letting down their guard and then the possibility that we are starting to get some reinvection as new variants. And so I think those two things things are balancing each other out. Hopefully in the next few weeks, as we get even more people vaccinated, we might finally cross that threshold where our numbers drop to where I really hope they'll be. Uh, but they're just not doing it quite yet. Um, you know, across the state, rural seems to be a little better, although it's easier to control a pandemic in rural area where people are just inherently more spaced out. It's harder in a metro area. Uh, so we're, our, our numbers are getting generally better, but not as good as we would hope yet. Um, same thing seems to be playing out across the whole country. There's still some areas still in what would be considered the red zone across the country, although they seem to be finally uh, 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 reverse, uh, turning a corner there as well. Uh, why, are the, why are we not improving as much as some had hoped? Well, I think the biggest problem is uh, reinfections. And so we've talked a couple times about the Brazil outbreak that uh, seems to be proving the herd immunity, uh, at least the natural way, wrong because people do get reinfected, especially with the new variant. Uh, we are now started getting other studies uh, confirming the same thing. So if you want to read more there, or hear more, there's a good public health on call podcast, uh, number 302, where they review some new studies out, out uh, beyond just Brazil. One of them uh, being a Kentucky nursing home uh, where they had an outbreak, uh, got it under control. And then uh, I think uh, roughly four-ish months later had a second outbreak. And unfortunately in that second outbreak, 12 people who had been infected the first time got infected again, one of whom died. And so the problem is, uh, it doesn't appear that either A, uh, either A, the problem is that herd, that uh, immunity from coronavirus isn't permanent wanes, or B, uh, the new variants uh, would sometime escape the immunity. Uh, immunity. One way or the other, though, you're not permanently good once you've had the infection, especially if it's mild, uh, asymptomatic, or you're older, it appears. And so if you want to hear a better, uh, you know, more complete story, certainly listen to this podcast. Uh, I won't go into too much of the details beyond that. Um, how are we doing in Nebraska? Well, we're kind of basically average across the country as far as, you know, how many, how, what percentage of people are vaccinated. So, you know, roughly 43% with you based on the New York Times website. Some of these other states are up in the 50, 60 range. Uh, hopefully we'll start getting there sooner, uh, but not as bad as some other states in the 30s though, at least. So we are making some progress with vaccination, but not quite enough. I think an important thing to remember though is that the numbers quoted are not for the entire population, they're just for the population over 16. And we cannot get to herd humanity until we also start vaccinating children. Uh, thank thankfully, they are starting to uh, vaccinate the high school students and the phase three trials for 12 to 15 year olds are out. And I suspect this summer we'll start uh, vaccinating 12 to 15 year olds, but we actually can't get to herd humanity from a vaccine standpoint until we're also vaccinating children. Uh, the numbers will just wouldn't work out. And so uh, we do need to get more than, than, you know, just the older than 16. So yes, 41% for the state, that still isn't enough to get there though. Um, you know, keep in mind, depending on how infectious coronavirus actually is, and the new strains appear to be more infectious. And so again, what I have is a range of what people thought the original version was, and the new variant maybe as much as an R-naught of 4.5. 12, that's actually measles just for comparison's sake. Uh, but if we have a 90% effective vaccine, we're going to have to be hitting probably 80, maybe 85% to, to get uh, herd, to herd immunity from a vaccine-owned strategy. If our vaccines aren't quite as effective, we might even be higher. So what that tells you is we may not be able to get there with vaccines alone. Uh, to get there, we may have still have to continue other things like, as we've talked, you may still have to worry about mass distancing ventilation and we may still have to focus on test, trace and isolate to get all the way there. And so the concerning thing is there are people letting out their guard already stopping the mask ordinances too soon. Uh, we're not quite the point where we can start doing that. And a big open question is gonna be, uh, will we need vaccine or will we, will we get mass, will we need mass the, the second, the next semester in school in August? And I think that's still an open question. Uh, and it depends how we're gonna do as far as vaccinating kids and that, where rates are going uh, for the rest of the community. 
Um, you know, Kaiser Foundation still is doing great studies on why people do or do not want to get vaccinated uh, and following it over time. And the good news is that over time, people are becoming more comfortable with the vaccine. Uh, the numbers that are that are saying I won't or I'm going to wait and see keep dropping. Uh, some good news is that at least on ethnicity, again, this is pretty much evening out, basically. And I think this problem wasn't that there was any anything inherent about uh, black or Hispanic people. It was the fact that, their mess that they just weren't getting messaged the way everybody else was. And so now that we're doing a better job messaging to them, they now want the vaccine. The problem for them is still access yet. Our biggest problem actually, honestly, is still is a party affiliation. People are deciding whether they like the vaccine based on their party affiliation, not the evidence, unfortunately. Um, the other thing is trust, and so uh, you know there's a lot of mistrust in the world right now. And one of my frustrations still, study after study keeps showing that you know who do people trust most? It's their own doctor or primary care doctor, uh, and especially the minorities actually trust them even more. And where do they want to get vaccinated? They want to get vaccinated at the doctor's office. Uh, but that's the one place in Nebraska most people can't get a vaccine. They can get it all these other places, but the one place we can't in most Nebraska locations get it is the place people most trust, which is frustrating. Uh, it's also frustrating because we have data knowing that the physician networks in Nebraska regularly get people vaccinated in rates above 80%. So influenza vaccination for 2019, I know that our, our internal One Health numbers, we just finished our 2020 data and we're at 84%. So we can get, physician networks are more than capable of getting people vaccinated at these higher rates, which will also be important if we need a booster later this fall. Uh, but this is one thing I think we need to work on in the future is, is also vaccinating through the most trusted source for uh, people. Um, the good news from a trust standpoint, I think, is how the Johnson Johnson pause was handled. There was some consternation over this, but I actually think this is exactly how the process is supposed to work. They saw a signal of some possible increased clotting cases. Uh, when they fought, saw six, they did a pause, did a more intensive analysis, actually found out there were 15. Uh, but then they went through and found out, okay, what when did it happen? Who did it happen to? What was it like? And now that we have the best data on this, now we know that it's safe to go ahead and go go ahead with the Johnson Johnson vaccine. Yes, there were some increased clots, but now we know a who it, who who's most likely to happen to. We also know how to treat it. So if it happens, it's a treatable complication, and now we can treat it correctly because we have a better understanding. It turns out that in an ordinary setting, you might want to use heparin, but in this case, you wouldn't want to use heparin. And so now that we made the appropriate pause. People know how to both identify and treat it more effectively. So the so the risk will actually drop because we did the pause and now we have the right information. Uh, they've done some great modeling on the harms, the potential harms of the vaccine versus the potential benefits. And you'll see that the numbers for harms aren't even close to the, 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 to the potential benefits, uh, especially uh, if we're going to give, you know, say 10 million more of these doses, for example. But they also broke it down in um, subgroups so that you yourself can make a better and more informed decision. And so, for example, we're finding out most of the clots are in women, and primarily women of childbearing age, so between the 18, ages of 18 and 49. And so then they then broke down the risk, not only on, on harms and benefits by gender, but also age. Now we can make a better idea of, of how, you know, what is my best choice. Uh, sometimes the numbers are a little less intuitive than we have to show a graph, so a graph sometimes is a lot more intuitive way to look at it. So here's another way of looking at it uh, from, uh, you know, from a picture. This is easier for people to interpret, actually. So, so if you're a young woman, what are the harms of, the, of a J&J &J vaccine? For every million patients, you might get seven blood clots, but you'd prevent six deaths, 56 ICU stays, and 297 hospitalizations. Keep in mind, this is not seven deaths, this is seven clots. So most people who get the clot are treated, actually, and so most don't die. And now, because we also know how to treat it effectively, that risk is even going to go lower. Whereas women over 50, the rate literally is one in a million. Uh, but he, a much bigger benefit. And so for a woman over 50, Johnson Johnson clearly is it's worth the risk and probably even for a young woman. Uh, so how might you make this decision? And my own daughter would be a great case scenario. She lives in Japan. We're hoping she'll come back this summer. Well, if she's only be, going to be here for a week, she can't get the Pfizer and Moderna. And in Japan is a a bit behind on their rollout, and they, she might not get a vaccine if she stays away in Japan till December. Well, if she comes and visits summer, if she's only here for a week, I would look at this and say, you know, if it's only a week, uh, the, the 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 risk is certainly worth the potential benefit. I would get her the Johnson Johnson vaccine if she's only going to be here for a week. On the other hand, if she's going to be here three or four weeks, I might try to get her the Pfizer Moderna because there that risk isn't with the same with Pfizer Moderna. So it lets help, helps us make a better, more informed decision, which is the whole point of a lot of this stuff. So I hope this generates some trust. Um, the other thing that I think we need to keep getting people to understand is that uh, there are different types of 
of immunity based on different vaccines, based on different infections. And some infections are what I would say are one and done infections, meaning once you get measles and pol or polio, you're not going to get it again for the most part. On the other hand, we have some things where we don't have, still don't have a good vaccine available like herpes or HIV, but we have lots of other, other infections where vaccine where immunity is temporary or there's immune, immune, mutations and you have to get boosters. And I think it's getting looking more and more likely that coronavirus is going to be like this. And I'm still not sure why people are so resistant to the coronavirus vaccine because we've been vaccinating these forever. And so I, uh, again, I've used in the past uh, the example of my own family. So if we go back in history, uh, my great grandfather, Herman Rundquist, uh, was uh, grew up born and raised in a time when lots of people died from infections and two of his older siblings died from diphtheria, uh, something we just never see anymore. I've literally never seen it in my career and neither is my wife. Uh, it's because we vaccinate everybody on it and we actually revaccinate people constantly for it. Uh, and so in the past, I've shown my own vaccine record. You notice this TD, which is a tetanus shot. Well, the T is tetanus. What does the little D stand for? Actually, the little D stands for diphtheria. So every time you get a tetanus booster, you're actually also getting a diphtheria booster. And it's that revaccination with diphtheria, which is keeping it from ever recurring again. As long as we maintain a decent rate, that's what keeps it away. And it's, good, it's a good chance that the coronavirus will be the same way. Uh, the other thing is that although it does show my, my coronavirus vaccine here, uh, last week I did, uh, or two weeks ago, I did talk about uh, the fact that you should be able to look up your own. Uh, unfortunately, when you go to this lookup, I've found more and more people now when they look theirs up, their coronavirus vaccine is not there. It seems to be mostly in the ones uh, who got their vaccine at a pharmacy. So it appears, unfortunately, we may have a database issue uh, with uh, Nessus with Nebraska. So hopefully this will get fixed in, uh, in the near future because we're going to need to have a good way to verify vaccination status. And so a good example, uh, the reason I didn't record a video last week is I finally took my first vac full vacation for a week and unplugged for a week. So I was gone. We did fly to Hawaii. Uh, we flew to Hawaii for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's one of the best controlled state. Uh, so not only is it a beautiful place to visit, it actually has, it's done the best with controlling coronavirus, but they also have a way to exempt yourself from travel isolation. Uh, they have a very good system where you get a test before you live, you upload your test. When you arrive, uh, they check you in. Uh, they also test you again on arrival but then they have an app and it loads up, loads up and says yes you've been screened and you're exempt from any isolation and what you would do is we you basically when you go to rent your car you show this in order to rent your car and then we go to check in your hotel you also have to show this and that's how they make sure that people are following the rules and doing the right thing but that's what's kept their their infections and, and uh uh, uh, deaths so low in Hawaii compared to every, all the other states are one of the things that's helped. And they're also already moving to uh, a vaccine exemption for travel. So you don't even have to do this if you're fully vaccinated. And they're actually just starting that up for inter-island transfer, but they're going to start working on making it so other people can come in. The problem though is that means we have to find a way to verify our vaccination status. So it's important that our state clean up the database so we can all start traveling again, because it's not just going to be Hawaii. It's going to be every place else. So the European Union is also potentially going to be letting us Americans come there uh, later this summer or fall, but we're going to have to have a way to vac verify our vaccination status. Um, the other reason that I've, I've talked to one of our guides in Hawaii about why the, why the Hawaiians did such a good job, and he said there's a couple of reasons why Hawaiians have done such a good job on, on coronavirus. Uh, one is they, they have a history of, of knowing how bad infections can be, because when Europeans con first uh, made contact about 200 years ago, uh, about 90% of Hawaiians died of all the infections they got, measles, uh, leprosy, things like that. So that's still in their cultural memory. Uh, also, the way they live, they know they have to deal with the disasters. So if you're from Hilo, in 1946, a tsunami came in, wiped out most of downtown. In 1984, uh, lava almost came within four miles of the town. Uh, the, the Hawaiians don't take life for granted, and so they're used to responding because they know they have to. So they, they, they think of things a little differently. They don't take everything for granted like we do. Um, and so, you know, graphically, how did they all do? You know, the state with the lowest mortality rate per capita is Hawaii. Maine's done very well as, uh, also. Nebraska kind of in the middle, but no, nowhere near as bad, thankfully, as South Dakota or New Jersey, for example. But as I've pointed out in the, in the past, uh, if you break Nebraska out, you know, we've got other groups. So Lincoln in, in particular did better because they did a better job controlling the pandemic. Omaha almost as well and rural Nebraska the worst, unfortunately, because how each of us approached the pandemic differently. And so, you know, this wasn't uh, determined, determined. There was almost a tenfold variation based on how states did. Some of us did better. Some of us did not. Um, so again, as you go back to your individual level, start thinking, you know, okay, what are the things that will impact my risk? Because we're not out of the woods yet, and we still need to get this under control. Uh, I've talked in the past that, you know, obviously with, you know, if you've got a combination of distancing and ventilation, like being outside, for example, do you really need to wear a mask, especially if you've been vaccinated? And so the good news is now the CDC is catching up and kind of telling us finally what a lot of us have been doing for months now already. 
uh, that if you're outside and you're vaccinated, you probably don't need a mask if you're not around a crowd. Maybe if you're at a soccer game, that would be a different story and there's lots of people, but they're starting to finally loosen up and catch up to what the West, most of us have been doing all along. I have not been wearing a mask uh, when I'm on the bike path, for example, or when we have friends over on the back patio. I think that's been safe and, you know, we've avoided infection the whole time. And so I think it's good that the CDC is finally releasing some of this. So again, uh, again, in conclusion, I think we still have a really good shot of keeping Nebraska deaths below 3,000. It's still the same thing. Wear the mask yet. We're not out yet. Uh, so if you're around anyone who's not in your household with unknown vaccination status, you still need to keep that mask on. Uh, avoid those crowded, confined spaces. Keep your distance and then to get vaccinated with your numbers up. Uh, we'll be out of this soon, hopefully, and hopefully, I really hope we'll be close to normal this summer, if, if not this fall, but we got to get enough people vaccinated. So again, hopefully this is helpful to you. Again, disclaimer, it's my opinion, it's not necessarily everybody I work with and for, and of course, the, all the other uh, uh, past episodes are on the HealthyLincoln.org website.